My name is Nelson Elschultz. I'm a second year master's student in the sustainability management program at the University of Toronto. I'm the organizer and moderator for this discussion, which is part of a research project in collaboration with U of T School of Cities and the Institute for Management and Innovation. I wanna thank both of these organizations for funding and support of this webinar, the MSCSM program and University of Toronto faculty who are instructing and supervising this project. We encourage everyone today to participate in the chat during the discussion, share your experiences and perspectives on the conversation topic. So you have a chat box there where you can share your uh, comments and the Q&A panel uh, where you can share any questions that you have throughout. And we'll be reading that during the Q&A section. Our chat moderator will be linking resources in the chat and a link to our research survey, which will be giving you the opportunity to share your experiences and perspectives on youth housing and enter for a chance to win one of $50 cash prizes. The call today will run for approximately an hour and 15 minutes. We'll begin with a 45 minute panel discussion, followed by a 30 minute Q&A. First, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Toronto's indigenous name is Tikaranto, which means where there are trees standing in the water. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit, indicating when these lands were purchased by the Crown in 1805. We also acknowledge that Toronto is a dish with one spoon territory. The dish represents the land now known as Southern Ontario. We recognize that all of us, settlers and Indigenous nations alike, have a responsibility to share this land by eating out of the dish with only one spoon. The spoon represents one shared access with a shared responsibility to ensure the dish is never empty. So we're all taking care of the land and all the creatures in it. As a settler on this land, I recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and a component of this is access to housing for all, which is one of the motivations for this webinar today. So today's event is a dialogue on the housing affordability crisis in Toronto with a focus on one demographic that is often left out of the discussion, our youth. Youth or young adults of the age 18 to 30 range are in a transitional life period seeking independence from their parents, including where they live. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought greater light to this issue than ever before, as the crisis has worsened disproportionately for youth and for marginalized groups especially. Housing is a basic human right, as acknowledged in the United Nations Treaty of 1948. Yet, as we all know, this human right is not being respected on a large scale around the world. So is COVID-19 the wake-up call that we need to start finally creating real sustainable solutions? Let's talk about this. Today, I'm joined by our panel guests, Da Chen, Deca Noor, and Kerr Matthews Hunter. Da holds a Master of Science in Urban Planning from U of T with a focus on Indigenous Studies and Environmental Planning and is currently the Indigenous Engagement Officer for Parks Canada. Deca Noor, is in the social development fields as community development director for local community projects throughout Toronto and has also worked on the Tenant First Advisory Panel for Toronto Community Housing. She's a mother of three and has recently completed a Bachelor of Arts in International Development at York University. Kara Matthews Hunter is a housing planner in the Strategic Initiatives Policy and Analysis section of the Planning Division at the City of Toronto. And like Da, he's also an alumna of the Masters in Urban Planning program at U of T. We also have with us today, Andrew M. Thomas, who will be our guest speaker kicking off the Q&A discussion, sharing his thoughts after the panel. He's a Jamaican-born Canadian who works primarily as an ESL teacher and is pursuing a Master's of Anthropology in Human Geography at U of T with a specialization in Women and Gender Studies. Andrew has lived in many neighborhoods of Toronto since 1998, and now splits his time between here and Munich, Germany, where he's calling in from today. I'd also like to give a shout out to 
Chuk Odenigbo, who will be helping us today as webinar support and moderating the chat. And also to Lynn Dalglish from Visual Talks, who will be our visual note taker for this afternoon. She'll be translating our discussion into visual notes on her whiteboard that you can see there. Feel free to check her out, uh, the amazing art that she has creating for us throughout the call. So with all of that said, let's get into our first question for today, which is, what was the housing situation like for young adults in Toronto pre-COVID? And uh, Da, do you want to start us off with that today? For sure. Thanks for the great introduction, Nelson. Um, I think for the question itself, um, it's really quite complex. Because when we're talking about young adults, it's a term that covers such a large demographic. When we talk about young adults, um, we're also talking about, for example, Indigenous young adults. Uh, we're also talking about international students. We're talking about LGBTQ communities. So just having the term young adults um, doesn't necessarily address the different lived experiences all the different groups are having. Um, for, so for the question you're asking about what are the housing situation for young adults, it's quite different from group to group. For example, there was a report by the City of Toronto that mentioned that in 2018, a large portion of the homeless population in Toronto were youth. And in that homeless population, a large percentage of them are uh, Indigenous youth and youth of LGBTQ communities. And additionally, when we're talking about young adults, we can also mention international students. International students are facing different housing issues compared to the ones who are living in Toronto. Um, young adults who grew up here because they face a higher tuition rate, which results in higher debt. So the housing situation for them is quite different. And just talking about housing situations, I think racialized young adults and, for example, white middle class young adults really have a, such a big um, difference in the experience. Even in the housing market, there are, we all know there are so much discriminations facing many young adults from racialized communities and LGBTQ communities. So when we're talking about these housing situations, I think it's important to keep in mind of those different, um, different groups that's within the broad term of young adults. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for drawing the importance of thinking about all groups. Uh, definitely some are not uh, included in the same way. Um, Deca, would you like to follow up and uh, provide some additional points on that? Hi, thank you so much uh, for having me, Nasun, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, um, I think uh, Da also covered the part that we cannot put um, all youth in just one group, because, you know, I, I some of the work that I did, um, what I noticed is that mostly uh, youth were sort of uh, more than 50% were sort of uh, put in a, in a more like a family, which we know that uh, youth do live with families, most of them, but not every youth have a family. So when we say youth, we think every youth have a family to back them or they're living with family. That's not the case, you know? So what happens to those youth who are, who are alone, right? And when we say youth, we're looking at the age at least 18 to 30 year, like 29, 30 year old, right? We know that the, the majority of late eight, late 20s, you know, in their 20s, most of them don't live with family. So I think their voices um, uh, are the ratio when you look at them, the voices of, of youth in that age is just um, not represented. I think that, that is where, in a way, I always use the term out of mind, out of sight. So if you're not in front of me, then most likely you know, things move on without your representative being in there. So I think um, youth in that age uh, has to be also included in one of the planning and one of the um, programs that are happening uh, uh, in, in social housing. Um, and I really believe that uh, moving forward, things has to change because youth are the future uh, they has there are the, our future somewhat that we look forward to to making changes. How are these changes going to be implemented, or how are we going to reach goals if that portion is missing? So I I, I think uh, from my work and and some of the things that I did, I wish we had more youth 
Um, but I think uh, moving forward, I will have a different perspective uh, after COVID-19 and we've seen what, what happened. And I think youth need to be in these spaces because they have, they somewhat, you know, um, have to get their portion. Mm -hmm. Thank you very Thank much, you. Deca. Um, could you maybe expand a little bit more on uh, what you've maybe seen in the social housing space in, in, in Toronto for, for youth pre-COVID? Like what were some of the things that you've, that you've been seeing in, in your work, maybe draw from some specific experiences? As a tenant first advisory uh, panel for the city of Toronto, uh, focusing on social housing, especially Toronto community housing, which is one of the, the second largest entity in, in, in North, um, North America, social housing. Um, I mean, you can imagine how many youth are living in these spaces. Um, and I, I think uh, we could have done better. Uh, I think we learn and I'm moving forward. I'll make sure that changes. Uh, youth need their space. When I say their space, their space to uh, share and, 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 and also uh, as an adult, I'm an adult. So as an adult, I, I cannot, um, I cannot not only speak, but I cannot feel the 18, 22 year old what they're going through at this moment. I can only talk about at this age, you know, or, or being a mother, what I'm experiencing. So I think we, everybody needs to not just uh, get a space, but space to the, the time and the need. So when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about tailoring to that individual. Yes, we, don't, we do have uh, a, a youth that live in, uh, in the merchant, merchandised communities, you know, so, sort of, yes. But each community has a youth. So how do we tailor to that individual need of that particular youth? Because as, a, as a Da said, every youth is different. There are youth who don't need that, um, uh, uh, that their voices need to be heard because they're either, uh, those voices are either uh, uh, there for them or they really don't need that, um, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say need, I mean, they have different needs. So if you live in Hamilton and you're a youth, you have a different youth needs than if you're a youth that live in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So how do we uh, meet, meet the youth, uh, the needs of our youth at this moment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We know the past before COVID, you know, we missed out a lot. Mm -hmm. Now that COVID-19 is showing us that we need to do better, how can we take from what's happening and what we missed moving forward? Uh, and that is uh, where I think most of us need to put our energy. Great. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Deco. Yeah, so you touched on a good point too. I mean, needs are gonna change uh, from, from city municipality to municipality. Um, so, uh, you, you mentioned Hamilton there as well. And when we're talking about the affordability crisis, this is not something that's just happening in, in downtown Toronto's core. This is something that we're seeing in those uh, municipalities outside of the GTA as well. Um, so yeah, let's, let's, get, let's hear from CARE as well on this, this topic as far as um, what, what, you're, what you've been seeing um, with uh, youth pre-COVID and then maybe also touch upon uh, more about the affordability and the planning side of things. Sure. Thanks, Nelson. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I think it's safe to say that the, um, you know, the housing situation of young people in Toronto, uh, as well as other cities, of course, pre-COVID was challenging, uh, to say the least. Um, I think it's important to recognize right off the bat that, you know, it is young people who are uh, the most impacted by housing market changes because they're the newest entrance into the market. Uh, they're the last in line to find housing and they directly confront the uh, full market forces in terms of housing affordability and availability. So when housing market conditions improve or deteriorate over time, uh, the effects of these changes are usually quite, uh, quite prominent among uh, younger cohorts. Uh, young adulthood is also the stage of life when people uh, usually leave the parental home to form independent households, uh, which means young adults are also the largest source of household formation and housing demand. Uh, one thing that I became interested in as a master's student is how 
Um, you know, over the last few decades, as the demand for rental housing in Toronto has outstripped supply, uh, young people's tendency to form independent households has declined year after year. Um, this is either because they're living with parents, um, you know, later into life, uh, because they're doubling up with more and more roommates to save on housing costs, or in the most extreme case, because they found themselves without a home altogether. Uh, so just to put this trend into perspective with some numbers, um, between 1991 and 2016, uh, the rate of household formation, that's the percentage of the population that has formed independent households, uh, declined by 2.5 percentage points among adults under 25, and by about six percentage points uh, among adults aged 25 to 34 years. Uh, together, these declines amounted to approximately 69,500 uh, young adult households uh, that were effectively foregone, um, but that would have been formed if young people had maintained rates in line with the previous generation. Uh, now, of course, there are a number of individual reasons, um, as Dawa was mentioning, um, you know, that might lead young people to, to form their living arrangements or live with parents later into life. Uh, you know, these may include family or cultural norms, uh, the inability to find a job, uh, high levels of student debt, and so forth. Um, but among the most important factors explaining this trend uh, over time within Canadian cities, including Toronto and uh, Hamilton, uh, is the shortage of, shortage of purpose-built rental housing. Um, we've also seen, uh, by looking at some of these trends, that you know, not only are younger people experiencing difficulty accessing rental housing, uh, but that those of us who have formed households are experiencing increased affordability burdens. Uh, for example, between 1991 and 2016, the real average rent in the Toronto Census metropolitan area increased by 24%, while the real average individual income of young adults, aged 25 to 34, decreased by 9%. Accordingly, the percentage of renters, aged 25 to 34, who are spending more than 30% of their income on rent, which is a commonly used indicator of affordability, uh, increased from 30% to 45% over that period. Um, so in other words, you know, in the decades leading up to COVID, we've had uh, significant scarcity in the rental market, causing rents to rise quite quickly, uh, increasing the percentage of income that young adults are spending on housing, uh, and this is in turn uh, depressing household formation. Um, so yeah, young people's housing situation was challenging, and, and I think it continues to be through this outbreak for sure. Perfect. Thanks, Kara. Going into details about uh, specifically the trends that we're seeing and uh, some of the things that have been leading up to that, like you say, there's a shortage of housing and uh, also uh, to do with the wages have not been keeping up with uh, the, 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 the rise in prices as well. So there's certain things that are working against youth in that way. Um, that ties us in well to our next question, which is looking at what are the underlying economic and social barriers that have been exacerbated and exploited under COVID. So specifically, what are we seeing that has, um, through the, the political system, through the financial system, what are, what, what are those things that ha are causing this in the first place? So um, I think actually, Kara, if you don't mind uh, continuing with this question, I think you have some good insights on this as well, if you don't mind starting us off. I actually really struggle with this question um, because as many of us know, COVID is obviously um, exposed and, and aggravated so many existing social and economic disparities in our society, uh, not only among young people, but across the population. Um, but because today's discussion is focused on housing and young people, um, I would really stress the barriers facing young adults in the labor market, uh, as well as the housing market. Uh, on the labor market side, COVID has to some degree uh, dampened young people's career prospects. Um, and it's exposed the vulnerability of part-time contract and low-wage work. Um, Statistics Canada has reported that, you know, in the decades leading up to COVID, from the late 1970s to the mid-2010s, uh, youth aged 17 to 24, who were not full-time students, uh, including those with and without a university degree, uh, experienced a substantial decline in full-time employment, uh, from 76% to 59% for men, and from 58% to 40% for women. And this decline was primarily driven by gains in part-time employment rather than decreases in labor force participation or higher unemployment. So, you know, not surprisingly, when the outbreak first hit in Canada, um, Stats Canada reported that, you know, it was young people and workers in less secure jobs who were the first to face mass layoffs caused by the pandemic. Uh, across Canada, 
mass layoffs directly impacted those engaged in part-time work, and it brought the employment rate of youth aged 15 to 24 down to a record low of 38.2% in April, and approximately one in four youth who remained employed lost all the majority of their usual work hours. And while youth have since recorded employment gains as industries have gradually reopened, uh, both youth employment and employment among low-wage workers remains far, far below uh, pre-COVID levels. Um, so in other words, you know, COVID has really, uh, really exposed and appears to be exacerbating uh, the, uh, the economic vulnerabilities associated with uh, labor market restructuring and with the increase in casualization of the labor force in particular. And these trends, of course, are directly connected to housing since having a steady income, as you know, uh, is a precondition of housing attainment and affordability. On the housing market side, we've seen that COVID has exposed the vulnerabilities of those who are residing in overcrowded housing. Um, in July, Toronto Public Health reported that the number of COVID cases um, was nearly four times higher among people living in areas of the city with high levels of overcrowding and demonstrated that these communities are also areas with high concentrations of poverty and racialized communities. At the same time, we know from census data that nearly one in three family households in the rental housing sector live in what we call unsuitable housing and experience overcrowding pressure according to our national occupancy standard, and that the likelihood of living in overcrowded conditions is nearly four times higher for families uh, who rent than for families who own, which suggests that uh, you know it's families in the rental sector who have been, who have been most vulnerable. Um, you know, and we hear stories in the media all the time about these people who, uh, you know, are moving back in with family during the outbreak, young people. Uh, it's often framed in terms of, um, you know, young people leaving their, their cramped downtown apartments to move into their parents' spacious uh, homes in the suburbs or, or smaller towns or whatever. Um, you know, but those families in the private rental sector who don't have a large house in which they can self-isolate and have returning family members who are perhaps single parents to kids or who are working, uh, these returns home would obviously uh, exacerbate the, the overcrowding situation. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Kay. Yeah, um, yeah you, you, t you touched on some great points there, um, especially with regards to those who are renting are, are especially the most vulnerable right now. Um, I'd also just like to point out that the affordability crisis that we're seeing in Toronto while youth are largely uh, being affected because they would make up the, more of a rental market than home ownership market, also those who are looking to buy homes are being affected by this right now because as we're seeing, the, the, the cost of housing is, it has been on the rise over the years. Uh, the average uh, cost of an, a detached house is uh, around a million dollars. So that's uh, something that whether people are looking to buy a home not renting is already much more than most people can afford. So this is, this is affecting all aspects of the housing market right now. Um, Dodd, you want to touch a little bit more up on this uh, question of the, the specific economic and social barriers? Um, That's right. Um, yeah. Thanks, Kerr, for uh, the great um, mentioning all those important points. I think just want to add on to that a little bit. I think one key point you mentioned is the racialized component um, of the housing market that many racialized people faces um, with, the current with the current housing situation under COVID. I think we see many reports coming out from the U.S. about how the racialized groups are actually uh, overwhelmingly affected by COVID compared to many other groups. And I'm sure the situation is similar here in Canada. So I think uh, a lot of these situations that we're seeing under COVID with people be losing their houses and becoming homeless, it's something that's already happening pre-COVID. Um, just like some statistics, um, the average rent in Toronto pre-COVID in 2010 was about 2,299 for one bedroom apartment. And this doesn't even take in consideration for many young adults, the financial situation that they're facing. According to a report from the Canadian Federation of Students, uh, the average debt of students in Toronto is $28,000. So, and this is something that many young people are facing when they graduate, having so much debt and looking at a housing market that's getting more and more affordable. Uh, just adding on to that a little bit more, according to a new United Way report in 2019, youth, especially racialized youth, are actually becoming poor over time. And they're actually becoming poor compared to seniors as well, making less of an income. 
So these are all situations that was happening pre-COVID and COVID really just brought all these issues to the forefront. These are not things that didn't exist before and COVID magically made them appear. These are always issues that were facing many on youth, especially racialized youth. So I think um, when we be looking at addressing some of these issues, I think we need to also look back on not just what's happening now, but what was happening before. How was the housing market treating um, racialized youth especially? Because we talk, I think Kara mentioned a bit about how many youth are moving back with their parents, um, you know, during the COVID. But for many racialized youth, they never had the opportunity to move out. They always had to live with their parents because of the financial um, financial situations. So just want to really, you know, bring that up to really remember to look at the, um, the different impact COVID has on racialized communities. And this is something that we really need to think about when we're talking about youth, um, the different groups uh, under that term youth and how their experiences are, are quite different. Mm -hmm. Thanks uh, for that, uh, Da. Um, we have a little bit more time here. Do, do you mind like, expanding a bit more on what you think those, those barriers are specifically um, as far as some, some, some youth groups being able to have better access to housing mm -hmm. versus you know, racialized groups? Mm -hmm. why, why is it more difficult for them? And, and why, is, why are we seeing this pro uh, problem continue to, to exacerbate? Mm -hmm. I think, for example, one group in particular, Indigenous youth, their Indigenous people have a really difficult time um, getting housing in Canada. I think a big part of it has to do with discrimination and stereotypes that many Canadians feel about Indigenous people. Uh, this has hap not just happened in Toronto, but many parts of Canada, like Ottawa, like Winnipeg. Um, indigenous people really face um, that barrier of discrimination and racism, to be honest. And I think that's a similar situation um, that faced many different group groups, like racialized groups and, um, and the LGBTQ communities really having that discrimination and racism that does play a big role in the housing market. And I feel like that's an issue that's often not talked about enough. Um, these serious issues that we often avoid because we, want, um, we don't want to hurt people's feelings, but these are really issues that affecting people's day-to-day -day life and their way to live. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for pointing that out, Dad. That's definitely not an issue that can be ignored when we're talking about housing affordability for youth. A decade, can you maybe expand on that uh, as well and talk a, a bit about your perspective of uh, social barriers for, for youth from racialized communities and minority communities? Uh, yeah, I, I mostly, I mean, I do work across Toronto. I mean, with Tenant First, we've been to so many spaces. Um, and, um, you know, at the time, it was mostly uh, mm -hmm. focusing on everybody. Uh, but looking back, I think the ratio of youth representation from different youth were pretty much, I think we didn't cover that. And now I can look back and say, you know what, they, like we could have done better. Um, I think, yes, COVID um, obviously uh, pushed the gap even bigger. Like that is what scares me, right? Um, but we do have youth, when I say, when I'm talking about marginalized communities, I'm talking about youth that's probably, uh, and being in different places, I can just, you know, talk about being a student myself at York uh, just this past year alone, and then have working in spaces where like, for example, TCHC youth spaces that I'm, programs that I'm working with, like, when I see youth that live with family, that's like seven family. And imagine you're youth who live with seven people and in the middle of COVID, you're doing your midtime, ex like your final exam. I'm, ju I'm just giving you one scenario of like certain youth, what they're going through. Um, and then, you know, it's just, it's so, you know, if these, we could have done better but now that we see even the impact, even such a greater impact that 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 the that that we see that the youth that are going through, I mean, um, you know, uh, especially where I mostly do a lot of my work is like um, west of of, of Toronto, and um, 
especially in Etobicoke, they have the highest youth in Toronto. So, I mean, working with the communities that, um, that are so, uh, in a way, marginalized and then having some of the youth uh, uh, in this condition, I think um, we, you know, I don't even know where to start. With COVID on top of it, uh, uh, coming out, I don't know how, how, you know, I think this is great way to really uh, talk about these, uh, what, what, what's happening with our youth. But I think uh, a lot of uh, families uh, uh, are, are, especially youth, you know, we talk about youth that are homeless. We talk about youth that are in, 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 in academia, but then in living these conditions. Uh, uh, the rent, oh my God, I have seen youth, I'm, I'm a mature student who work. I can't imagine when my, some of my, you know, uh, uh, youth that are in the same programs that are telling me, Daka, I don't know where I'm going to move this summer. I know youth that have to move this summer from, you know, from the dorm rooms to the villages, you know, it's just, there has to be, I, I think to me, what, what, I, what I imagine is something like anytime a youth go, goes into a space, they don't have to worry of how that space is going to look like. That space should be provided to them. Just like many of our adults, things you know, you go from space to space. If you move from Otobico to Scarborough, you know how to navigate the system. I think that's the word I was looking for. Mm -hmm. Some of the youth, um, it's so difficult for them to navigate the system, a system that they should have been part of. Mm -hmm. They have to struggle just to go from point A to point to B. It shouldn't be like that. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I, I want to see something like that. I mean, I had students that are, you know, that have, that are like Deca. I don't know. I, I'm 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 still searching for a space, you know. I'm like don't don't go away like far away from from you know your your your, your space like that you need to this the universities or around. But some of them have to have to go like maybe 30 miles away from school find a space because that's that's something that they can afford, mm -hmm. you know. And I think if there was a space big, big enough for everybody. They don't have to go 30 miles away from school so that they can save, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, $300, $400. Like why, mm -hmm. you know, uh, similar mm -hmm. thing. Why does the youth have to live with eight people and do their finals and their papers and everything? Why? Why does the youth have to be homeless? Mm -hmm. Because they don't have family. Why? They didn't choose not to have family, but those programs, those spaces should be there for them to access their needs. Something that tailors their needs should be already there. So when they land in a place that they need to be, there should be a process waiting for them. Um, I don't know how that we're going to do it, but I think it's doable. And because we, we talked about our seniors. I'm so like, Mm -hmm. and, like, I'm very, um, I'm somebody who advocate for vulnerable, uh, our vulnerable communities and our seniors, but like the fact that we didn't put that much energy as well for our youth, um, I think we need to revisit and have that same passion uh, mm -hmm. for our youth as well. For sure. And, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that answer, Deco. You touched on some really great things there. Um, that's going to bring us into our, our third and final question for the, for the dis, uh, discussion. So you were, you were talking about things that we should be seeing. Um, and as far as more youth participation, um, how can we ensure that youth can stay in the city and don't have to travel so far for work? And how can we ensure that spaces are not so crowded, but at the same time, we're still using land use in a good way. So the final question that we have for today is, from a housing perspective, share with us your dream Toronto. So 
Deca, since you were just uh, going off there and I think you're, the juices are still flowing, maybe you can uh, continue your thoughts in, in terms of what you would actually like the city to look like from an economic standpoint, from a social standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, because these, these are the three tenets of sustainability. Thank you so much. Um, um, as you can see, every, you know, I'm very passionate about community development and, and social justice and social, especially social innovation. I think um, um, those are very uh, crucial when you're working in the social development and uh, field, uh, especially as a community development, because I focus mostly on the profit tunnel would be a, a, a tunnel that we think that we focus on mostly on human development uh, uh, as a social uh, uh, development worker. Um, my focus, number one, would be the human being. How can um, whatever we're working on would be something that is beneficial to the individual community um, and more inclusive, uh, uh, diverse, uh, something that would be you know, circulating um, as a core, and the core would be, of course, human development. Uh, in any development that we do, as I believe, as human beings, would be a failure if the human development is not the core of that development. Uh, so me, like my, I think the Prophet Toronto would be a Toronto that focuses on that human development before any uh, political development and any economic development and all the stuff that we, we, we have to also uh, do on the site. Um, I think, um, again, when we come back to, to human development, uh, I think we did focus on adults, families, seniors, uh, or vulnerable uh, 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 communities. Uh, um, but I think, I think we missed out our youth and when we talk about youth, we always focus on spaces where they can, recreation, right? Like the things that comes out in mind, like youth, recreation, yes, okay, what else could, should we do for them? Uh, mm -hmm. Jobs, should we find it? Okay, homes. Home is the fundamental, it is a fundamental uh, 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 need. It, it's, a, it's a necessity. Home is, you don't have a home, you don't have a job. You don't have a home, you don't have a dream. So for me, home brings, it, it creates that youth. It gives them something to move, a step to take, to be, you know, independent, to feel part of, you know, the circle that we're always advocating, the circle that we're always talking about, that everybody should be not left behind. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, for me, that would be a perfect tunnel. Sure, I told yeah. that our uh, new graduates don't have to think about, oh, am I going to be homeless mm -hmm. after four years of studying? I mean, mm -hmm. like you, why are you even thinking about becoming a homeless? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and some of them Deca, have a job, uh, two jobs, mm -hmm. and they still can pay the rent. Why? Mm -hmm. So I think that would be a profit turner for me, mm -hmm. focusing on our youth, focusing on their needs and putting human development uh, in, in the core of, of, of our work. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, uh, we have about five minutes left here. So we want to make sure that uh, Karen Da will have a chance to speak. Um, uh, you were touching on some great things as far as as far as homes. What, what is that going to look like for youth? So um, maybe Karen, can you share what to you that would look like in a, in a dream Toronto as far as putting putting youth first? What's that going to look like in the future? Yeah, so I, I uh... I agree with that. Good. You know, I, th I think that without sounding too cliche, um, you know, I think most of us share the dream that you know everyone in Toronto should have access to days or sorry, safe, secure, affordable housing. Um, to achieve this dream, uh, it's pretty clear I think that we need a lot more rental housing, including private, affordable, and social rental housing, uh, as well as supportive housing. Um, at the same time, you know, it's highly important that we, um, you know, for the planning perspective that we continue to replace, um, protect and replace the existing stock of rental housing. Uh, otherwise, new gains will only be offset by losses. 
Uh, in terms of protecting rental housing, the city of Toronto uh, has been relatively successful in protecting affordable units through its rental housing demolition and conversion bylaw and associated official plan policies. Uh, in 2019, um, city council also unanimously adopted uh, new official plan policies to protect against loss of dwelling rooms and rooming houses, uh, which have been uh, appealed to the local planning appeal tribunal, the LPAT, uh, but will hopefully be approved in the future. And this is all in addition to the city's new short-term rental regulations and registration system, uh, as well as other policies uh, in the official plan that secure the rental tenure and improvements to existing rental buildings uh, through development applications that involve um, significant intensification. I think what Toronto and indeed, you know, uh, many other communities across Canada have really struggled with uh, is the supply piece, uh, mainly because uh, you know, most of the policy levers and fiscal capacity uh, required to create large volumes of rental housing uh, rest with our federal and provincial governments. Uh, the city's new housing TO action plan is a target to create 40,000 new affordable rental units over the next 10 years. Um, and the city will, for its part, you know, contribute public land, uh, development incentives and capital funding to assist in achieving this target. Um, but the city is ultimately, uh, you know, relying on the federal and provincial governments to make substantial investments uh, beyond what is being required, or sorry, what is currently being provided under the national housing strategy. So I, I know Nelson's really, you know, uh, interested in, in solutions. So, you know, I think these requested investments from the federal and provincial governments uh, to implement the city's housing plan uh, would be a starting point. Um, I think the city would also be interested in uh, federal and provincial tax reform that would make investment in new rental housing more attractive, as this is mentioned in the plan. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, the city's Urban Development Roundtable uh, established a rental housing working group uh, that worked with city staff to address the lack of uh, new purposeful rental production in Toronto. Their final report, um, you can see it referenced in the official plan, made a number of recommendations for all levels of government uh, to stimulate new rental housing. And to date, none of, these, um, none of these recommendations, which included changes to income tax legislation, uh, GST legislation, other important, uh, important things, uh, none of them have really been implemented. Uh, so I think uh, revisiting some of these might be worthwhile. Uh, as one last thought, um, uh, this guy is Steve Pomeroy. He's a housing consultant and senior research fellow uh, at Carleton University in Ottawa. He has recently come out and suggested the need for a, a national uh, non-market acquisition strategy. Uh, this would enable nonprofit housing providers to acquire apartment buildings with below market rents and to shift these buildings um, into a, a non-market environment uh, where they can be managed and preserved as affordable homes before uh, before large institutional investors could acquire them as profit generating assets. And I've, I've recently read in the news that uh, BC's Nonprofit Housing Association and Co-op Federation uh, is exploring this idea right now and they're in talks with the, uh, the BC government with a proposal to create a capital fund for acquisition purposes. Similarly, uh, we've seen the City of Montreal has recently adopted a bylaw uh, that will allow it to exercise a right of first refusal uh, to purchase rental properties when they come up for sale for the purpose of acquisition. So there's, there's a lot of discussion going on, um, you know, about these acquisitions, acquisition of these older rental properties. And I, th I think those are all really interesting developments worth watching. Great. Thanks, Kerr. Um, let's, let's, let's give Da a chance to talk. Uh, we have maybe a couple of minutes here. I don't, sorry to cut you off uh, short, Da. Um, yeah, do you want to just share your thoughts on, on your, Dream Toronto, and then uh, we can hmm. uh, move into some final thoughts. Sounds good. I think a, for me, a Dream Toronto is where everyone actually has the capacity to dream. Because I think right now, not everyone can have that capacity to dream. Many people have to focus so much on getting by a day-to-day -day basis, surviving. We can't really think about dreaming something bigger. While other groups can dream about bigger houses or something more and beyond. Um, I think personally, for me, a Dream Toronto is where housing will be seen as a human right, as opposed to housing as a, for, as a property, housing as property for profit. So something where everyone has a fundamental right to housing. I think that for me is a ideal, ideal Toronto to live in. But obviously we know that's kind of hard to get to. So for me, I really want to see, um, I want to see avenues for youth to be more engaged in housing policies. Because I think right now, when we talk about housing policies, I don't think youth voices are represented. It's predominantly represented by developers who are there to make a profit. 
while we don't necessarily have youth who are at the table and have a voice at the table that's being heard. Um, I think there are many reports that comes out every year. We already know about what the issues are. We already know about the issues facing youth in racialized communities. What we need is action. So for me, a dream Toronto is actually people acting on these policies and suggestions that we already have in reports. City of Toronto has many reports on housing, but can we actually do something to address these issues? And can we actually have a avenue for young people to be involved in and actually have a voice that's, um, that's taken seriously as opposed to just there at the table as a box taking. So for me, a dream Toronto is Toronto has for housing as a human right and a, a avenue for young people to be engaged and involved in housing policy in a, in a meaningful way. Perfect. Thanks, Da. So that, that's, that's pretty much the time we have for discussion. Um, thank you for each of, for all three of you for sharing your thoughts on that. Uh, there's been some really great points that have been raised that I hope uh, people, if you have questions, you p can please post those in the Q&A and we'll get that, to that very soon. Uh, I just have a, a couple takeaway points that I want to go over just based on what's been discussed. I think one major theme that we've been going over is that youth, of course, have not been a center focus in housing policy despite the fact that they are the future generation and they're going to be the future of the city. So why is this the case? Why are we not putting them first and making sure that they have a, a place to live that is inclusive for all? So youth also have to be more engaged, but how can they be engaged when there's all of these social and economic barriers that are preventing them from being able to uh, act and upon these types of things? And so really, I think what it comes down to uh, with, with, with housing is and we're talking about sustainability i mean if, if we're looking at bigger issues that we're facing today environmental issues climate change we're not going to be able to face those things until we can really solve things at a local community level at a housing level i actually have a quote here from dennis carr from the ccpa monitor 2017 and i think that he touched on this point very well he said that the fundamental tenet of sustainable development is social sustainability which prescribes that environmental issues cannot be solved without first addressing inequality and poverty. So I think that ties in really well to what we're seeing at the micro level within uh, youth communities. And um, that's, that's, I think, what we have for discussion. And I would really love to uh, now kick things off for Andrew. Um, he, he can share his thoughts with us on what's been discussed so far what areas he feels we may have missed based on his own unique perspectives. And uh, he'll start off the Q&A for us today. So Andrew, uh, love to hear your thoughts. Please take it away. Um, hello everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction, um, Nelson, and thanks for having me. Um, I do appreciate everyone's, um, I really um, thought it was thoughtful. Um, everyone's, everyone brought up some very insightful points. Um, especially just, you know, as a, not necessarily a long time permanent resident anymore of Toronto, but having lived as a, as a youth, <laughs> I'm no longer youth, <laughs> but, um, since I, I missed the cutoff here, I guess. <laughs> um, but I think that a lot of the points that were brought up were very salient. Um, however, it reminded me of um, when I lived in Queen East in 1997, when the Harris government actually passed, um, I forgot what it's called, but it was the Rental Control Act. He had repealed the one that was in place for over, I think, 50 years or so. And that actually led to the housing boom and the privatization of much of our housing stock or the disinvestment of housing stock across Ontario. And I think for myself and my, um, my uh, cohorts or my, my peers at that time, you gradually saw a creep in um, the prices of rent. Now, kind of jumping off what Dahl had said previously, I think the term youth is, you know, it's a catch-all term that does not account for many things such as queer people, but people who are queer and racialized, or people who, who are queer, racialized, and probably differently abled, or indigenous people, or queer migrants, 
Um, and I think having that sort of perspective and having been a queer youth myself and, you know, have, having experienced homelessness through times, um, in, in fact, most, much of my peers, um, I can think about the fact that, you know, is, are we really having a crisis? Um, and as Da had said, you know, we have done endless reports. Endless reports have been done even during my time in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s. They've done countless reports and research. I think it's important to kind of jump in back to the other panelists to take, I believe somebody dropped something about the profit motive. So I think if we kind of look at the positionality of the people in City Hall and those who are Queens Park and including the federal government who are making policies, it would be those who are less harmed by these policies um, who are more likely to push this sort of economic theory of housing um, that, you know, says that you only deserve housing if you're making $100,000. Um, this does not account for the fact that everyone is a deserving of housing, you know, irrespective of whether we can um, work or not. And, you know, as I said, having experienced homelessness myself um, and housing precarity, having to pay 60, 70, 80% of my income working at the body shop or Gap or um, any service level jobs, which frankly most youths are doing, and you're more likely to do that if you're a racialized youth. Um, and if you are queer racialized youth, a lot of the times you end up doing that or sex work, like quite a few of my friends have done. And then you're double or triply or quadruply um, discriminated against. Another point that was brought up was about um, familial structure while not, you know, most cultures don't necessarily ascribe to the mother, father, uh, child um, idea of family structure. Um, it does not necessarily mean that we want to live in, the, in, in a large family. It just means that we may not have a choice. That being said, um, in my experience and that of many of my peers, especially in the mid 90s, early 2000s, where now it's almost seeming normal to walk down the street being queer, that was not the case. It was also not the case to be um, given a home, oh, sorry, to get a, a housing very easily. Or, and if you do get housing, it was not necessarily something that was um, clean or sanitary. It could be some dungeon, some, some really uh, moldy basement. Um, and again, I think with the Harris reforms and the disinvestments from the, govern the governments at the time, I fail to remember, you see a gradual erosion of social housing stock, but also so an increase of um, condominiums all over the place, um, privatization of previous housing stock as it is here in Germany. And the idea that the invisible hand of the market will correct it. Now we see 20 years on, that has not been the case. Um, and, you know, every area that has been or was considered, for example, when I lived in Queen West, this was considered a ghetto area or, you know, rundown. Now, this was back in 2001, 2002, nobody would live there you know, queer people, racialized people, migrants, young people could live there. Now it's increasingly unaffordable. Um, and again, I personally think it's a, a lack of willpower and it has to do with those who are in charge and they're not the ones that are not necessarily feeling it because I think the question we should ask, you know, who are making the policies? Who are the ones most likely to benefit from the status quo? And we see this with the most recent change in government with um, Kathleen Wynne's liberals, where they had actually reintroduced um, uh, housing or rental controls on new units, um, actually no backdate in it, I believe. And Doug Ford went ahead and repealed it, but at the same time too, kept minimum wage way below what it should be. And so you do have students um, who, again, you are, it's a rock is between having soup for the next six weeks or the next four weeks or paying your rent. You know, I personally, when I do come to Toronto and having to look for apartments, I'm astounded that I'm paying the same amount that we pay for apartment for a four room apartment here in Munich. The same thing. You see this on many of the websites. 
um, for look for student housing where you see a one bedroom is for fourteen fifteen hundred dollars. What is the justification for that other than profit, right? So I think that you know, in a sense, um, you know, in the late nineties two thousands, it was a bit more cheaper, you know, and I put that in scare quote because that's all relative. But at the same time, things have not gotten better, but actually gotten worse. And it's a lack of though it's a lack of, I don't want to say lack of willpower, it's a purposefully purposeful not doing anything. So I think any conversation around housing and youth definitely has to address all of this from an intersectional standpoint that actually centers capitalism right at the heart of this. There shall be no movement, I think, in my opinion, in over 20 years um, of this sort of observation that we're not going to get anywhere with piecemeal solutions. Um, because it's very clear that people, people in committees or making these reports, it's just publishing more and more, more um, reports while, you know, queer youth, racialized youth, indigenous youth are the ones that are paying a higher price. Five or six or 10 youths, and they're all doing the same job. But the moment you apply this sort of lens, you see that it's just um, people are differently affected, some greater, much greater than others right now. It's trans, right? But that doesn't mean black folks and other youths, sorry, black youths and other youths are not as affected. It's just differently. And then when you look at the wage gap between youth based on gender, race, and sexuality, that also plays a big role. Also to um, inequalities that have existed you know, anti-black racism, indigenous racism, not getting the same pay for family members. So some families might be able to have money for their children to allow them to not have to worry about um, housing, right? Most black families do not have that capital built into a home. And so those are some things to think about. And then we have to either move away from our families if we have issues with families, if it's sexuality issues, um or religious issues or whatever issues that we're running into or we move much much further as we can see with um, regent park for example the gentrification of regent park where the government did not do any sort of investment for decades but now it's been completely re um i don't i forgot the word now revitalized and what you when i went there there's not that many um people that i could say were the people that had inhabited that space for 50 plus years, most of, most of them have been moved out. So then they're moved out to transit and food deserts and have to commute greater distances. Um, and this also takes a toll on your grades if you're a student. I'm not a student, and I know this um, firsthand having lived in, in Brampton in the 2016-2017 uh, year, and I had to communi commu um, commute um, uh, three three hours, pretty much. And so I think the housing crisis for youth is extremely acute, but I would also kind of beg the question, is it really a crisis? Because a crisis should be a short thing, a short period. This is going on for decades. And so the question that I would ask us to consider is whether or not the people in charge are actually willing to do that sort of legwork I'm always looking at the positionality of the lawmakers and the policymakers. Are they just offering piecemeal solutions, right? And so kind of looking across all the panelists questions, all of, you know, which, which all of you have raised some great and salient points, I think it's important to consider at the heart of this sort of enterprise is a profit motive. And I think, um, comparing my time in Canada, nothing has changed, but also thinking about the situation in Berlin, in which the government, the city government, because it is a city state, um, took over, I think it was 100,000 units from private, from private property management, because it was the same thing that they were doing. And in fact, one of those companies are in, is in Canada right now. I think it's Aculus. It's a Swedish or Danish company. And you, going, sorry, sorry to have to. Oh, sorry. No, no, sorry. no. You, sorry. sorry to have to cut you off. Uh, we we're running a little short on time for Q and A now. Um, but those were some really great points. Um, I think you really helped to fill in some of the gaps that we had from our discussion, and you brought some intersectional perspectives into things, and you touched on profit motive, which I think was very important as well. 
Um, so we're now going to open it up to this uh, Q&A. Um, so we have a number of questions here currently uh, that people that have been patiently waiting. Um, if anyone else has any thoughts on what Andrew shared or any of the questions from before, uh, and you want to direct it to a specific person, please indicate that in the Q&A section as well. So we're going to start off with uh, one question here from Asha Dahir. How can youth be more involved in policy development when it comes to housing? Uh, maybe Dodd, you want to start that question off? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, you know, the uh, traditional answer that um, will be going to your councils or going to your counselor and talk to them and get involved. But personally, I think it would be really great if you could get together with many of other youth who are thinking alike and come together and really, I guess, work towards building on something that could help address these issues. I, I do know it's like, it's important to, you know, have those connections to the policymakers, but I also think it's really important to work together with many others who are thinking alike, it could be organization out there that exist, or if there are not any organization, maybe come together with like-minded youth in your community or in your network and really create something that you can, you can push, the, push, you know, those in power to really make these changes. So really, I guess, strength in number. If you want to make changes, strength in number. G gather as many people as you know who think alike and come together to create something. Mm -hmm. Like a webinar, for example. <laughs> yes, webinar. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that, Da. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to Naz. She has a question here. What is the provision of social housing like? Do councils in Toronto help with affordability or do they enable gentrification? Uh, maybe, Deca, do you want to take that question? Uh, we, we, we do have a few other questions here. So... Uh, if you could try to keep it under two minutes, but I would love to hear your perspective on that one. So uh, do you, would you like me to read it again? I don't, I'm not sure if you can see the question here. Just sum it up. What, what was it? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah. what is the provision of social housing like? Uh, do, do councils in Toronto help with affordability or do they enable it? Do they enable unaffordability through gentrification and other means like that? To be honest with you, uh, that is just like a, like a broad question, but I'm going to just quickly give my my idea. To be honest with you, I, I kind of uh, agree with what Da said, but um, again, we have to understand that um, not everybody's uh, way of seeing uh, is, is the same, meaning even some of our, our counselors, our representatives uh, are not there to, to see the way your, your lens is the issues, right? Like they would try, but um, I think youth have their own lens. So uh, the counselor, uh, you know, they might for or against certain things, but your voices matter. So because your voices matter, that if these issues about youth, uh, youth tackle that, uh, obviously uh, uh, that, would, that would be, for me, that is, where things should be. Uh, again, we have to understand that youth are youth, that sometimes their capacity to reach uh, 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 or tackle some of the issues, uh, we cannot just say, you know, you guys deal with it, come up with the solution. No, they are part of our society and their needs must be met. And whatever issues that are facing them, it's not something that only them can fix it. They have no control of the policies, but they can put their policies. They're not the ones who vote on these policies, but they have to be part of the planning on, and, and, and the reports and they have to, their voices. Basically, my point is we need to create the space for them to present their needs. And if that space is not there for them or the city or the counselors or our representatives are not understanding that, then this issue will continue whether we like it or not. Sorry, I, I have to kind of quickly set my point before I go around it. But that's how I would answer that question. For sure. The, the great answer. Thank you. And, and I think like, like you said, I mean, it's, it's about making the issues known. But um, I think this also does tie back to what uh, 
Andrew was saying before, as far as profit motives, I mean, the, the issues can be known, but if there are certain structures in place that are preventing those issues from wanting to be heard because profit motive is ruling, then uh, there's maybe some other movements that we have to be pushing forward in order to address that. We have a question here uh, from Catherine um, that I think we'll, we'll touch up on this. And I think it's, it's a good one for care. So do you think the commercial developers, those in power, are acutely feeling the impact of lack of housing right now due to the pandemic? If the damage is felt, is it enough of a crisis emergency to make action? Um, so I, I think everyone, uh, you know, uh, large cross sections of everyone across the city um, is feeling this, the, the affordable housing crisis. And I think that it's, it's been going on for a long time. Um, you know, I'll definitely say that I work with, with developers all the time in development applications and, um, you know, for, for a lot of them, you know, they, they definitely understand and a lot of them, um, when they provide uh, funding through Section 37 of the Planning Act uh, to provide community benefits, um, you know, they like to provide affordable housing if they can, or, uh, you know, they apply to the city's open door program to provide affordable housing. So, you know, I think that, you know, tenants, um, developers, people, you know, across the city are really feeling the crisis for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to hit you with a double question here. So follow up, because um, I think this is something you can follow up on as well. Um, I think you mentioned it earlier, but um, Alex is asking here, are there real estate developers in Canada that are building affordable housing units? And if so, do you have some details of, of where and what that looks like? Um, yeah, they are. Um, definitely, definitely doing that. Um, maybe definitely not on the scale that we would like, of course, but that's also, a, you know, a policy issue in, in order to create those incentives and, um, to make it happen. Uh, like I said, through development applications that we have the city and we secure, um, new affordable units through section 37. Uh, we've principally done that through our large sites policy in the official plan where, um, you know, there's a site greater than five hectares in size. You prioritize community benefits to be affordable housing. Um, and then we have, uh, like I mentioned earlier, there's a national housing strategy where there's been, you know, a couple of funding envelopes that have been created to, to stimulate uh, the production of new affordable housing. Um, there are legacy programs that are doing that. So there's definitely, you know, developers in Canada building affordable housing, um, but, you know, it, do, it does come at a cost for sure. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. We had some comments earlier in regards to, um, Homelessness, uh, Jillian was commenting that she was working with a, uh, a program for Toronto's COVID-19 homeless population uh, as a peer support worker. She mentioned that uh, uh, this, this program was making sure that employees were getting paid a fair wage of $25 an hour for work. And uh, we recently had a uh, comment that was asking in regards to wage, um, she said, uh, con well, considering that rent prices have skyrocketed before COVID, how can we ensure that everyone has a livable space in the city? So this uh, touches, I think, on um, the fact that uh, rent prices are are also not being able. Uh, sorry, the the wage is not able to keep up with the prices of rent. So is that maybe something that you can comment on, uh, uh, Doc? I'm just looking at the question again. Do you mind? Yeah, sure. So this is from Laura. It's considering that rent prices have skyrocketed before COVID. Mm -hmm. How can we ensure that everyone has a livable space in the city? That's a difficult question. <laughs> That's a tough question. I think it's a, it's a similar, it's how do we ensure we have livable space? I think this is a question that we all want to have an answer to. Um, but ideally, I think, could, could be both ways. If we can increase the minimum wage that people can more able to afford um, housing. But at the same time, I think it doesn't matter how much minimum wage increases, it will never increase the same rate of rent and housing prices. I think this kind of goes back to the last two questions that um, Kira answered about the commercial developments. I think a big part of the housing price increase is the commercialization of, uh, of, of housing. Um, so 
there needs to be policies that need to address those issues first. Uh, because if we just look at rent price increase on its own and not really taking consideration the broader picture of housing as a, housing as a property in the market um, and the market and the neoliberalization of housing over the recent years, it's not just enough to look at rent. So I think if we want to ensure how people can become more livable, I think we need to first address how housing is created, how housing is being treated um, by the policymakers. Mm -hmm. And personally, I think just adding on to like the question that was answered before, even the term affordable housing, what does that mean? Affordable housing definition is 30% below market rate, but if someone's making minimum wage and market rate for housing is $2,400 a month, that's not gonna do much to address the housing issue that people are facing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really big question that um, takes a lot more work and effort to really address. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my quick answer, but it's, it's a really- a good answer, yeah. Question. I was trying to kind of tie, tie two questions in there because uh, we're trying to address an issue of rent as well. Someone had mm -hmm. asked a question regarding rent. Um, just a quick thing based on some research that I had done is that, of course, minimum wage is uh, around $14 an hour in Ontario, $15 mm -hmm. in Alberta, which is the highest in Canada. Um, they're saying that the, the, the wage that, that we would need per hour in, in order to afford yeah. the average unit in Toronto at a comfortable price would be 20 to, 20 to $22 an hour. And that's just not yeah. something that we're seeing right now as a minimum wage. And that's in order to afford a $1,400 to $1,500 um, housing unit. That's, mm -hmm. that's probably on the low end, actually, for a lot of uh, Toronto. So um, there's definitely something that we need to do as far as filling in the, a wage gap where we're seeing about $5 um wage gap right now um but we do still have a few questions that we want to uh, cover here uh Kishé has asked uh a couple questions she, she she wants to specifically know about gentrification so she's asking how can we retain the youth to live in affordable housing amidst the gentrification movement so she's thinks that uh the gentrification movement could ultimately push youth away from toronto how can we provide a solution to this issue? I think, Andrew, you were talking about gentrification in your call a little bit. So do you think maybe you could touch up on this question? Um, could you repeat the question? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so um, in your opinion, do you think gentrification could ultimately push the youth away from Toronto? How can we provide a solution to this issue? So she wants to know, like, can we, can we retain the youth to live in affordable housing amidst the gentrification movement? Um, I actually don't think that's possible unless it's, there is a broad systemic um, solution in the sense that almost everyone who, you know, of my generation, but also to my nieces and my nephews have moved away from the city. My cousins who are much younger than I have have moved out of the city. Some have moved to Montreal. Um, where it's a lot more affordable and in line with their with their remuneration, and I think that um, any piecemeal approach is not going to be effective. It should be an approach that, again, where the government takes the lead and not on private investment, because private investment is there to make profit, and that is always going to be there. And as you see, you know, just to go back to my earlier point, um, taking off the rent control, but also, you know reinstating a, um, a wage of $15, it makes no sense, especially when, again, that which house prior for one bedroom is 2400 and most of the affordable units are being taken over by international corporations, which is allowed, for example, by Aculus, um, and then they make a little change, they change the doorknob, and the one bedroom is now um, $1,700, when most people in service industry are making that. I think for young people such as yourselves and for others, um, applying any sort of intersectional lens, it becomes even evident that many youth, some can stay, but a vast majority will not be able to sustain themselves in Toronto. Um, and if they're working downtown, they're then gonna have to commute. But also to, just like those of us who are able to live near campus, the youth that are pushed outside of the GTA or the downtown core are also going to miss out on a lot of quote-unquote growth opportunity in terms of the career. 
So you have, again, the long commute to work, but also, too, you have to run home to get on the go or to take the car home. You're also impacting in the environment plus physical health. Um, so I don't think um, a piecemeal approach will work. I think a systemic government-led, not enticing um, developers to develop models because most of the condominiums, I believe they do get some incentive to build affordable units, but this is 20 years now. Most of them don't, or they do on an insignificant scale, not to offset the amount of units that we actually need. And so I, I don't have a solution to it other than for me, it's like it has to be addressed from the government without the profit being there. Private interest is not going to want to get rid of profit. So I think that has to be the question at the center um, to Great. keep you. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. Um, no problem. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think this really comes down to awareness. It all comes down to having awareness, and then once we have that, then we can go about actually developing the solutions. We had a couple more questions here that we weren't able to get to today. Apologies, Jillian and Anab. Uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions after the event. Um, but that said, this has been a very insightful discussion with all of your thoughtful questions and comments. A reminder that uh, we will be posting the recording of this webinar on the School of Cities website, so you'll all be able to access the, these resources later. Also, we encourage you to take part in our youth housing survey, which is really valuable for our MSCSM research project goals in working towards a more sustainable housing system for youth. Thanks again to our panelists today for sharing their expertise our support team, and Lynn for your beautiful artwork. We're happy to post that later as well. Finally, I want to thank everyone in our audience. Your participation has been very much appreciated. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.